across tonight. Let's go and stand on our feet, grab your song books. Let's sing hymn number 349. Hymn number 349. Glory to his name. On the first, down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. I am so wondrously so sweetly abides within, there at the cross where he took me in, glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name, there to my heart was the blood of life, glory to his this mountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood Hymn 251, The Cleansing Wave. Amen. On the first, oh, now I see the crimson wave, the fountain deep and wide. Jesus, my Lord, mighty to save, points to his wounded side. I see, I plunge it, oh, it cleanseth me, oh, praise the Lord, it cleanseth me, it cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. I see the new creation rise, I hear the speaking blood, it speaks polluted nature dies, seeks me the cleansing flood. The cleansing stream I see, I see, I plunge it, oh, it cleanseth me, oh, praise the Lord, it cleanseth me, it cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. I rise to walk in hands of light above the world and sin, with garment pure and garments white, with Christ in I see, I plunge it, oh, it cleanseth me, oh, praise the Lord, it cleanseth me, it cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. Amazing grace is heaven to feel the blood of life, and Jesus only, Jesus know, my Jesus crucified. The cleansing stream I see, I see, I plunge it, oh, it cleanseth me, oh, praise the Lord, it cleanseth me, it cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. Amen.
You think that writer wanted you to know that it cleansed you? Amen. Amen. I'm glad for the blood. Heavenly Father, tonight, thank you for allowing us to gather in your presence. Thank you for allowing us to be with you. I pray that you'd bless in this service, you'd guide and you'd direct. Every word that's spoken would be for your honor and for your glory, and that you would move in a tremendous way in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. You all may be seated. I'm going to switch over, Brother Roy. Amen. There we go. Switch over. Make sure we're good here. Da -da 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 -da. Amen. Well, now I messed everything all up. Forgot the tablet tonight, so. All right. I hope they can hear me. Amen. If they can't pretend, all right. Um, we've got a uh, missions conference coming up about a month, and uh, looking forward to it. Just talked to Brother. Mike Cox today and uh, confirmed some things. He was wanting to make sure things were going good so he could buy tickets. And they were good prices. Amen. And he asked if he could bring his wife. And I said, bring her on. Amen. That'll be exciting. And that uh, we're still working on getting some other missionary families in and just looking forward to what the Lord's going to do in our missions conference. You'll be in prayer for that. Uh, that is the 2nd through the 5th of May. The 2nd through the 5th of May. And uh, looking forward to it. Haven't been able to have it for two years. And I'm excited about our missions conference. We'll be focusing a lot on what goes on this month around the missions conference. Getting our hearts ready. It's coming out of the way things are going right now. There maybe have to be some adjustments made when it comes to travel. When it comes to um, things in the country. How you do things. But, you know, mission work has always been an adjustment. You go to the mission field, you've got to adjust all the time to the way things are. But just because it may become a little bit more difficult, it may be a little bit tougher, doesn't mean that God's command has changed. Right. And we want to talk about how, oh, how tough it is. Oh, how tough it's going to be. Can you imagine getting on a boat and sailing for months, knowing that you're probably never going to go home? Never see uh, uh, loved ones again. I mean, the, the old missionaries, uh, they left with the idea we may never go back home again. They didn't have the opportunity. They didn't have FaceTime and, and texting and all that stuff they have now. Sometimes they left family, they left friends knowing they would never see them again. And yet they went. And they had to cut their way through jungles. They had to uh, do it... Um, Many of them went to the mission field, and it took them years to have one convert. Years to have one. Go into language. They didn't have language schools back then. They didn't have those types of things. They had to go and learn languages that were strange and difficult and complicated. And they just had to do it. And yet they did it. And so uh, we may have to make a little bit of adjustment in the future of how to travel around, how to move into countries, how to get there, how to do things. But it doesn't change the commission, folks. We still need to get the gospel all around the world. We need to get it here, and we need to get it around the world. So let's focus our attention uh, these next few weeks on missions and the heart of missions and getting the gospel out and all that exciting stuff uh, that is coming up. And uh, beginning this Sunday... Uh, we're going to be, begin the process of, of training, uh, getting folks ready uh, for uh, when we are able, uh, hopefully very soon, when we are able to begin uh, opening up Sunday school classes again, the bus ministry as that happens. And we're going to take the time now to be prepared so that when it happens, we're ready to go. And so we're going to be looking for um, teachers. Teachers, bus workers that have heart and are ready to learn and are willing to pour their heart and life into children and teenagers as we get closer to the end. The world is, has already trained a generation to do its bidding. We're going to have to reach into this dark world with the, with the light of the gospel and rescue some of those kids and teenagers. But it takes dedicated people, dedicated to the cause of Christ. So we'll be 
starting to prepare for that and getting ready starting this Sunday. We'll talk more about that Sunday morning uh, as we prepare our hearts and our lives. I, I want us to come out of this a stronger and better church, a church that has uh, uh, teachers in place that, that are dedicated and with a heart for the Lord and for the children and willing to sacrifice to reach the next generation. And so we're going to be starting that process this Sunday. So we've got some things coming up. Turn to Genesis chapter 3 tonight. Genesis chapter number 3 tonight. And the uh, Lord has laid this message on my heart. We have an enemy. You have an enemy. Um, he's not an enemy that we need to be afraid of as a Christian. But we need to, do need to understand we have an enemy. And we need to be vigilant. And we need to resist him. Because if we don't, he will create havoc in the church, in families, in your life. We have an enemy. And it's very interesting in here in Genesis chapter 3. The first thing we know about this enemy is now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. There's nothing from the beginning of the book to the end of the book that says anything nice about the devil. Every time you see him being talked about, he is not nice. First thing he's called is a serpent. Uh, any ladies here like snakes? Dead ones. Dead ones. <laughs> I agree with you, sister. I don't like snakes either. I don't like them either. I don't even like going through that snake house and the Gladys Porter Zoo. I get about halfway through and I'm like, I'm ready to get out of here. Get me out. Saw a movie when I was a kid where there was a broken glass and the snake got out and bit somebody. And I just, uh, so every time I go through there, I had, any of you remember back in the 80s and 90s, they had that one snake cage that was cracked? Yeah, by the time I reached that one, I was ready to get out of that place. Say, man, I'm, I'm gone. I'd look and make sure I could see him, and I'd think, but what if there was two? Uh, but uh, I was ready to get out. I don't like snakes. Snakes uh, don't have a great reputation. Uh, when we lived in Arizona, we had a lot of snakes. Rattlers. Rattlers. Um, and, and then you had king snakes. And he used to say, now don't kill the king snake, because the king snake is the enemy of the rattler. And I used to think I'm not getting close enough to check. I don't care. Snake is a snake out there, you know? And, uh, boy, we kill a lot of rattlers. We kill a lot of snakes out there. And um, uh, we just, it, it was, I, I don't like them. I don't like them. Most people don't. There are those crazy people that do. Uh, but most people don't like them, you know? And uh, I had a friend when I was young that we found a little garter snake. Even a garter snake. So, I mean, I'm kind of like, okay, I understand, but I, I yeah. But he had it like there, and his mom came up in her car to, to say something to him. He said, hey, watch this. He said, hey, mom, look. You've never seen a car drive off and a window go up faster. And it was the old crank on the passenger side. You ain't never seen that thing go up faster and that car take off. You know? And, of course, we laughed and laughed. I'm sure he got it good when he got home, but uh, it was fun for the moment. Uh, but, uh, but snakes, I mean, we, they don't have a good reputation. So... From the very beginning, what we know about Satan, first of all, he's a serpent. Sneaky, sly, cunning, he's subtle. That word subtle means elusive, cunning, crafty, worldly, knowledgeable, deceitful, treacherous. That's a snake. That's the subtle serpent who is our enemy. We have an enemy, and he is after you, he's after your family, he's after the church, he is after your testimony, he's after your, your, uh, um, your heart, your mind, your soul. He is the enemy. And there's nothing good said about him in the Bible. Nothing. The only time, well, the only time there was anything even intimated was good was before his fall. When he was the angel of music, that's about, that was it. But that was very quick before he fell. He's wicked. He's evil. He wants to destroy you. 
And it is an amazing thing to me that the devil from the beginning has been using almost the same tactics through history. Now through history, he's had different tools. He's had different ways of implementing. But when you look at what he did to Eve, you will see that he's been using the same tactics against us since then. You say, why does he use them? Because they work. They work. One of those things, well, why change my tactics if they work? And so this is what we see here in chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. We see here the first interaction between humans and the enemy. We see the, the tactics that he used, this subtle, deceitful enemy of the soul. The one who we are supposed to stand up to, and we have the whole armor of God to, to stand against the what? The wiles of the devil, the tricks of the devil, the fiery darts of the devil. He is our enemy, and he has tactics that he uses against the Christian. Tactics. And he will use them against you tonight if you allow him to. And so we see, first of all here, the first tactic we see is in verse number two. Verse number two says, and the woman, um, uh, I'm sorry, in verse number one. Verse number one, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. One of the first things that Satan does is he attacks the word of God. And he twists the word of God and he, he casts doubt upon the word of God. And he does that in many different ways. It's not just one way. He, he has done that with, uh, uh, with the translations of the scriptures. He's done that with the different versions. He's done all of those things where he has, he has attacked it in that way. He also gets people to doubt whether the word of God is for this day and age. It's another way he does it. Well, I know that was for Bible times, and I know that was for the Old Testament times, but I don't know if that is for today. When they turn to the 21st century, you would hear things like that, where it was, well, it's the 21st century, as if we don't need that anymore. That was for before, but this is the 21st century. 21st century, 1st century, 21st century, B.C. The Word of God is the Word of God. Amen. That's right. But he loves to cast doubt on the Word of God. He loves to get people to doubt the Word of God. What he loves to do is get people to doubt what God says in the Word of God. And he'll do that to Christians. Christians will begin to look at it and say, well, you know, I don't, I don't know if that necessarily applies to me. I think that, I think that, uh, I'll give an example, uh, a story I was told in, in, that in, in uh, you know, from another country, a missionary was saying that uh, they were dealing, they were talking about tithing and how God's people need to tithe. And, and someone in their church told them, well, I believe God knows we're poor and he will understand. Well, but the Bible says... And the Bible doesn't make distinction, poor, rich, other country, our country. He doesn't make distinction. He says, give. He says, don't rob me. But in their mind, because they were poor, that gave them the right to change what the word of God had to say. 
Well, I understand that, uh, you know, I, I know the Bible talks about this and the Bible talks about that, but, but I don't know if that's necessarily necessary for today's day and age. Or I know the Bible says that whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. But I, I, I see people all the time reaping bad things and they never seem to sow anything, or sowing bad things, and I never see them reaping anything. And so in our mind, we begin to uh, listen to the lies of the devil and we listen to the lies of his cohorts, the world and our flesh, and begin to think somehow that the Bible doesn't apply to me. That I can find the loophole. I can find the way of escape out of that. And it doesn't matter as long as uh, God knows my heart. So it doesn't matter what else goes on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The word of God is the word of God. And you better believe it. But he begins to get us to doubt the word. To doubt the word. The Bible says he's the father of lies. The father. I mean, he is the one that uh, 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 started all that business. <laughs> he gave birth to lies. That's what a father does, right? I mean, he gave birth to lies. He's the one that started all of that. He's the expert at it. And so he'll lie about the word of God. And he'll get you in your heart and in your mind, your heart and in your mind, thinking things about the word of God and, and thinking that maybe somehow that doesn't necessarily apply to me or, or well, I, I know God said he would do that, but I think that uh, you hear people say things like this. I know what the Bible says, but I don't believe a God of love would send people to hell. You better believe the Bible. You better believe it. I know that it, that it says, what shall a man sow it, that shall he also reap. But, but um, I've been doing this and nothing's happened to me yet. You better believe the Bible. You better understand it. The father of lies will cast doubt on the word. That's one of his biggest tactics. And Christian, you have to stand against that and fight against that and resist that. And you need to take the word of God and say, I will believe it. I don't care what the enemy says about it. Don't care how he casts doubt. And I'm telling you, he's got a lot of disciples that are twisting the word tonight. And trying to make it say something else. And Christians are buying it. Hook, line, and sinker as the old saying is. They are buying it. They are getting hooked by false teaching from the word of God. Christians tonight think some of the weirdest things about the word of God. They have found a way to make the word of God fit their lifestyle. You're not going to get God's word to fit your lifestyle. You're going to have to fit your lifestyle to the word of God. And you can make excuses all you want, but one day you will stand before the living word and answer for the written word. And so we got to understand that's one, of his, that's one of his tricks. But he wasn't done. He has more tricks up his sleeve. So let's keep reading. It says, verse 2, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the, gar the fruit of the tree... Which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So the first, first tactic that he used, cast doubt on the word. Second tactic that he does is he gets you talking to him. He gets you talking to him. He gets you listening. He gets you paying attention. He gets you to start having a conversation with him. It's an amazing thing. I've, I've had... Uh, people come and, and, and try to talk to me about different things. And, and what they want you to do is a uh, salesman wants you to get in a conversation with them. If they can get you started in a conversation with them, many times they can convince you to buy what they're selling. And that's what the devil wants to do with Christians. He wants to get them talking to him, listening to him, uh, uh, arguing with him, debating with him, uh, listening to what he has to say. Look what he says. Look what he says. Or look what he does. He asks her a question. Why did he ask her a question? He wanted an answer. If he got an answer, he's got her talking to him. And if you get in the habit of reasoning with the devil, you'll lose. Because he's subtle 
And he's the father of lies. It's amazing to me. I, I've listened to some, some men preach egregious errors very convincingly. I mean, they are very convincing. I am not a hyper-Calvinist. I'm not a Calvinist. I believe that it is a doctrine that has done great damage to the church. But they're very convincing when they talk about it. Very convincing. Some of the modern movements, which are trying to move us away from our Baptist roots, are very convincing in what they say. And what they want you to do is start a dialogue and get interested and start listening. And before you know it, your mind is being shaped. Your thinking is being shaped. And what Satan wants to do is shape your thinking. He wants to get you talking. He wants you to get you listening. He wants you to get you interested. He's always been that way with sin. He's always will give you an introductory drug of some kind to get you started. And if he can get you listening and he can get you started... Before you know it, not far down the road, he'll hook you. God are talking to him. But you know what the Bible says in James 4, 7? Resist the devil. It says, submit yourself to God, therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. You need to stand up. There's only one way that you should be talking to him, and that is throwing the word of God in his face. Isn't that what Jesus did? He didn't try to reason with him. He didn't try to have some long soliloquy and some long, all he did is every time he brought up a temptation, word of God, word of God, word of God. There's times when you need to resist, but you also need to learn how to flee. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, flee also youthful lust. It's interesting, we like to preach that to young people, right? But that's for all ages. I know a lot of older people that have gotten caught, caught up in youthful lust. But for all ages, you better understand, there's a time to resist, there's a time to flee. And you better learn how to do both. You know what Eve should have done right away? Ran back to Adam. Now there's some, I, I've talked to some, there's some that believe that Adam was close by, that she didn't have to go far. But either way, Adam needed to protect her, but she needed to be with her protector. She needed to get away from him. She shouldn't have hung around and talked with him and let her tell him, let him. And as soon as he started to throw his stuff up, his error up, she should have gotten away. And you better get away too. And I'll tell you this, Satan many times is not going to come to you like this in an actual form, he'll bring people into your life. He'll bring people into your life to teach you lies. He'll bring people into your life to try to convince you that their way is better than God's way. This world is really good at selling itself to the Christian, selling itself to people and making it seem like it's good and before you know it, you will be hooked, hooked, cast out on the word, got, got her talking to him. And what she did not do is resist him. And what she did not do is flee. I'll tell you, folks, you're going to get yourself into trouble. You start trying to reason with the devil. You start playing around with the devil. Look, we as, we as Christians need to stand, us, stand strong in this world and we need to talk to sinners. We need to be trying to convince them of the word of God that they need to be saved. But when you start to getting, in, getting into these discussions about sin uh, with, with this world, you better learn to resist with the word or you better get away. I had a teacher when I was in college who said that uh, he had a rule. He said they lived on a little farm, a lot of places that you can hide around in there. When his children got to the age of beginning to date, he always had a rule. He says, I better not catch you parking. I better not. 
He understood what was what could happen. So he said that uh, he had a son that decided to uh, flaunt the rule. Uh huh. So he said, "I went out. I went out and I found the biggest stick I could find. I went up to that car and just started banging on the roof." So you never seen two young people jump out of a car faster than those two did. He said, "But as soon as his son got out, he said he was more scared of me than he was of that banging on his roof." You better learn to resist. You better learn to run. And you better not listen to what the devil has to say. And you better not buy what he tries to say. Because he will make it appealing. And he will tease you with it. And he'll play on your flesh. And he'll play on this world. And he'll use this world. And he'll play on it. And before you know it, if you're not careful, you'll listen. And you'll end up at the end of the pig pen. Cast out on the word. Get you talking to him. Then look what he does in verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Here's a third tactic that Satan loves to use. Remove consequences. Remove consequences. What was the word of God? If ye eat from the tree, you're going to die. So if you do it, you're free to do it. But there's going to be a consequence. And so what does Satan do? He comes along and he tries in your mind to remove consequences. He goes after the consequence. You're not going to die. You're not going to die. This world has, this world so misunderstands the long suffering and the mercy of God. That they think because when they do something wrong and they don't immediately get disciplined, that God is letting them get away with it. But there's always consequences. It may be a year, it may be five years, it may be ten years, it may be fifteen years down the road. Always remember this, God's time is not our time. And God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And he does things differently. How long did Jacob get away with stuff? before it all came crashing down around his head. You know what he ended up doing? Even after he got right with God, the whole last part of his life, all he did was deal with and struggle with his children. Right? That whole situation with Dinah and that city and then jealousy over Joseph and selling him into slavery and fighting and arguing and battling, and, and you know what he ended up paying the price of? Having children that acted just like him. He paid the price. So what about David? Have you paid attention to what happened to his life after Bathsheba? One heartache after heartache after heartache. And he lost children through it. One half-brother raped the half-sister, and then Saul, uh, uh, um, uh, Absalom killed him, so he lost that son, and then lo he lost the baby, and then he lost that son, and ultimately lost Absalom, whom he loved. What a mess. Look, folks, just because God is long-suffering and has mercy and grace doesn't remove consequences if God said it it's going to happen that's why the Bible says be not deceived God is not mocked whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap you know what the Bible says the first three words are be not deceived and what does he do here He's deceiving Eve into thinking. And here's an interesting thing about that. After they ate, did they receive the consequences right away? Well, it was many years later. But did they eventually die? Yes, they did. Didn't happen right away. In fact, they lived to the ripe old age of 900 and something. 
I'm sorry, I don't want to get that old. <laughs> I don't mind being 900 years old in heaven, but, uh, uh, you know, I'd rather be gone by then, amen? But, but the point is, what is a good thing from God, the long-suffering and mercy and grace of God, Satan will use it against you to make you think you can sin and not have consequences. But there's always consequences. Then look what happens in verse 5. So we've seen that he cast out on the word, gets you in a conversation with him, gets you talking to him, gets you interested, removes the consequences. And then look at verse 5. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Oh, how Satan knows who we are. And he knows that we are vain and full of pride. Humans are vain creatures and full of pride. Why do you think that some of the most famous shows are extreme makeover? If I just look better, I'll feel better. If I could just walk out and everybody goes, oh. We love that. We love vanity. We love being patted on the back. We love people to fawn over us. We love people to give us attention. We love to get puffed up in pride. Vanity and pride. And he uses that against her. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Whew. Think about that. Being told that they could be like, they could be gods. They could know good and evil. Why would you want to know evil? They knew all good, right? Why would they want to know evil? Oh, but playing on that vanity, playing on that pride, fellas, we got to be real careful. You got to be very, very careful about pride. Pride will lift you up and destroy you. Ladies, you better be careful about vanity. You better be careful. You better be careful about that vanity. You better be careful about what they're saying in your ear. Careful. He uses it against us. Cast out on the word. Get you talking to them. Get you in a conversation with them. Get you to, get you to, to start to thinking about what he has to say. Removing the consequences. Appealing to our vanity and pride. And then look at verse number six. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Not only does he get you to doubt the word, get you to listen to him, remove consequences, appeal to your vanity and pride, he also uses your senses and emotions against you. He uses your senses and emotions against you. That's why they make sin look pretty. Pretty. They do. They have this public service announcement about smoking, and it's this woman who talks with this real gravelly voice, and she talks like this. But then they show a picture of her when she was young, and she was beautiful. Then they show a picture of her now with the voice thing and, and all that it has done. But you know who was not showing that? The cigarette companies. They don't show the twisted, mangled bodies from a drunk driver. And you know what's so frustrating about that? Do you know how many times it seems like somebody, the drunk driver walks away and the people in the other car die? It, it, just, it just seems like, I don't know how many stories I've heard of that, where they walk away and everybody else is dead. They don't show the, the young lady that uh, uh, a pastor told the story of a young lady in, her, in, in his church that, that went out and got drunk and fell asleep on a railroad track, and next thing she had no legs. Don't tell about that. No, nah, they want to make it look good. They want to appeal to your senses. They want to make it seem like if you just take this or do this, it'll 
drown out your sorrow and it'll change everything and it'll help you. He'll use your senses against you. Fellas, he'll use those senses against us. Why do you think so much advertisement for men is about women scantily clad? You know what he's using against us, right? He's using our senses. Why do you think that they have all of the candy and sodas right by the cash register? Because they know Matt Schumacher's going to come through. <laughs> they know I'm going to be tempted. Right? Sure. They know. You do know they design those stores, right? You know there's a reason why you walk in and you smell the frying flaming bird when you walk into H-E-B, right? You know that, right? They got it set up because they want to appeal to your senses. And Satan will do the same thing with sin. He'll appeal to your senses what you hear. What you hear. You're walking through and not even really paying attention. All of a sudden you realize your head's going like this. Well, that's the music. Senses, right? Appealing to your ear, appealing to your taste, appealing to your touch. It's a reason the Bible says it's not good for a man to touch a woman. And by the way, that's talking about before you're married. There's a reason. Boy, that touch starts something. It'll start something that doesn't need to be started. He knows what he's doing. He likes to use our emotions against us. Get our emotions all stirred up. Get us thinking things we shouldn't think and get our emotions feeling things we shouldn't feel. And before you know it, you got yourself into trouble and he uses our senses and our emotions against us. So he casts doubt on the word, the father of lies. He gets you in a conversation. He gets you to listen and pay attention to what the world is selling. He removes the consequences. By the way, getting back to that, getting you to just start paying attention, why do you think the Bible specifically put in there that Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom? When Lot first left Abraham, he did not go into Sodom, right? He just pitched his tent toward it. He just looked so that he just put it so that they could look down in. So they could see what the people were doing. So they could pay attention. Getting them interested. Getting them to pay attention. And then you know what the next thing we see about them? They're in Sodom. Well, they got better schools there. Well, uh, our, our daughters could be better socialized. You ever heard that one? Better socialized. You paid attention to the schools today. You really think that's good socialization? They get, they, they, you know, we can, we, can, we can have a better life down there. I, we won't have to battle so much with being farmers. We can go down there and be somebody in that town. And before you know it, they're in the town and they're a part of the town. And before you know it, uh, 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 the daughters are marrying wicked men. And, and before you know it, Lot is a part of the city and, and part of the council. And, and, and the Bible says he vexed his righteous soul living there. Be careful. He just wants you to start paying attention. He'll, re he'll try to remove the consequences. By the way, he can't remove the consequences. He'll just try to convince you that he can remove the consequences. Or there are no consequences. That's why they had that big campaign in Europe where it said God probably doesn't exist, so do what you want. What are they trying to do? Remove consequences. They don't want to believe in God. They don't want to have to answer to anybody. There's consequences. They don't want those. He uses your senses and he uses your emotions against us. And then this is what he does in verse number 7. The eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. He got her to sin. He got her to then uh, 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 take it to Adam and Adam sinned. And then you know what we don't see anymore? We don't see the serpent. Because once he gets you, he'll abandon you. He doesn't care. This world doesn't care. Doesn't care. This world is built to use and abuse. 
Satan loves to use and abuse. We have an enemy, folks. There's an old saying, uh, you ever heard that he's, he's playing chess while you're playing checkers? That's how it is with a lot of Christians. He's using strategy and you're just hopping from place to place. I don't believe we have to be afraid of Satan. I don't believe that we have to cower in fear because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. But you better understand and respect the fact that you in the flesh are not going to win against them. You're not going to do it? There's a reason why he says put on the whole armor of God. There's a reason why he says submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. There's a reason why he says flee also youthful lust. Because he understands in the flesh, you trying to stand, you will fall. And then when you fall, he'll laugh at you and he'll abandon you. Let me ask you a question about the prodigal son. Where were all his friends? When he was in the pig pen. Some of you older people, you've had experience with that. Being dropped by the people of this world. We better understand we have an enemy. And you better submit yourself to the Lord. And you better get clothed in the armor of God. Because if not, one day, you will reap what you sow. And you're going to look back and say, what happened? You allowed the subtle, cunning serpent to convince you of something that's not true. And when it's all said and done and your life is a wreck and ruined, he's not going to be there to pick you up. But you know who will? your Lord and Savior. I, uh, when I was young, we, my parents worked at the Roloff Ministries. And if you know anything about the Roloff Ministries, it was a ministry to try to help people that were in trouble, drug addicts, people in trouble with the law, different things like that. And they'd have testimony time sometimes. And boy, those... Those fellows or those ladies get up and talk about their testimony and all the things they've been involved with and all that stuff and how the Lord saved them. And, of course, everybody shouted an amen and hallelujah. And I didn't have that type of testimony. I hadn't gotten involved with any of that stuff. The closest I've ever come to drinking alcohol is NyQuil. Didn't run around before I was... Married, didn't do all that stuff, don't have that type of testimony. And sometimes, though, you'd sit there and you kind of think, man, I kind of wish I had that testimony that anybody would amen. But then when you got to talking to some of them and you paid attention and you saw the things that they were still battling today because of the decisions they made back then, I'm glad I have a testimony that's different. Can God use those that have fallen all into sin? Absolutely. Praise God. And we do praise the Lord for his wonderful mercy. But the idea that somehow that makes your testimony better is a bunch of baloney. The younger you get saved, the quicker you get to serving God, the better it is. Because you won't have those memories and those embarrassments. You won't have to fight all those things. I wish, I wish when I was younger that I hadn't gotten involved in the rock music that I got into. Because to this day, there's lyrics that I can remember if I hear the song. To this day. It's amazing. I forget some of the simplest things, but I can remember that stuff. And I wish now I'd never heard it. There's consequences. I sure I'm glad.
that I don't have to go back and look at this, that I, that I just tragically destroyed everything in my life and then came back to the Lord. Thank God, thank God for the story of the prodigal son. It gives hope to those that are deep in sin. But also thank God that we don't have to go that route either. Thank God that you can be a Timothy, that from a child knew the scriptures. We have an enemy. And I just got to be honest with you. I hate him. I hate him. I can't wait till he's bound for eternity. I have seen in my life the destruction that he has wrecked in homes and people's lives and it makes me angry. I get frustrated with myself when I listen to him. But you know what? I'm here to tell you something. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Through Jesus Christ, we are more than conquerors. I don't even understand what that means fully. I just know we're more than conquerors. We're more. Through who? Jesus Christ. Maybe tonight you just need to get on your face before God and determine. Determine this. I'm not going to let the enemy destroy me. I'm just not going to do it. Heavenly Father, help us. Lord, our enemy is destructive. But you... You are greater than he. The enemy is a destroyer and a liar. He breaks through to steal and to kill and destroy. But you came to give us life and that more abundantly. I pray, Lord, I pray that the enemy would be defeated in our life. That we quit listening. That we quit being deceived. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're saved by the blood tonight, aren't you tired of losing out to the enemy? Aren't you tired of listening to him? I believe there's some Christians need you to get to an altar and just say, God, with your help, with your help and through your power, I'll have the victory. Let's all stand together. The piano begins to play. The tray begins to sing. You need an altar? There's a place for you at the altar. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the sea.
in the light of his glory and Amen. Y'all may be seated. Amen. I'm going to say good night to Facebook land. Thank y'all for joining us. We're going to go into a time of prayer as a church. As we thank you. Devotions tomorrow morning at 10. Sunday service is regular time. 10 o'clock Sunday school. 11 o'clock service. 6 p.m. evening service. And uh, so we will see you all later.